Acts chapter 16. Ma- Acts 16. Yeah, it's written up there, huh? <sighs> ah, um, it's amazing to me how evil people can be sometimes. Or evil things that we can do. You know, and sometimes they're not. They're evil, but they're not evil. Like the other day when Jason was in a, he was in the meeting, the missions meeting, I wasn't there. And so I was texting him from the outside to see how things were going on the inside. And he, I, I mean, I thought it was well over by now, and I texted him again. I was like, are you still in that meeting? He's like, yeah, and I'm starving. So I decided to text him a picture of three delicious In-N-Out burgers with animal style and fries. <laughs> and he texted back, you're evil. And I said, yes, I am. And then I, and then I texted him a bowl of Lucky Charms. Jason likes Lucky Charms. They're magically delicious. Um, But, you know, just observing people, you know, I don't think people realize how evil they are sometimes. And, you know, it's, it's, as observing children, you see it from a very young age. You start to watch them, and you watch them malign and trick and deceive and hurt and steal and... All kinds of things. I mean, it, it, just on a smaller scale, they are capable of just about anything, aren't they? It's amazing to me. And yet, I don't think that anybody realizes how evil they really are until they accept Jesus. I mean, we might think we're a pretty good person. You know, I think a lot of people think, oh, I'm a pretty good person. And then Jesus comes into our lives, and he shines his light, and all of a sudden, the, the most seemingly wonderful person notices the darkness that lurks beneath. And they begin to um, you know, repent and, and just it amazes you, you know, really. But as you know, people are capable of horribly wicked things, awful things that are beyond imagination. And um, we're going to look at the, just some people that are like that in our text today, and we're going to see a little girl who's been taken advantage of, not just that she's been possessed by a demon spirit, but also that she is owned by a group of men who are exploiting um, this demon possession for fortune telling. And, you know, we're in our day and age, we're um, aware of human trafficking. I think we're sensitive to this type of thing. But it, what what fascinates me about this passage is how they react when this little girl is set free from this oppression. So let's take a look. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. It says, Now it happened, as they went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when the masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to observe. Then the multitude rose up against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet with stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone, everyone's chains were loosed. So, just for some background as to where we are, how we got to this place, you remember that Paul and Silas were on their, um, well, Paul's second missionary journey as they traveled north from Antioch of Syria, um, heading north up into the, and around up into the area of Galatia. And in Galatia, they were um, at the cities of Lystra, Iconium, and Derbe. And they picked up Timothy, a young man who was um, half Jew, half Greek, remember, and, and they took him with them, 
And their plan was that they were going to go to Asia Minor. They were going to go this large portion of area, hundreds of thousands of souls that had never heard the gospel in that region. And of course, you're familiar with the cities. The cities in that region are um, Ephesus and Corinth, and not Corinth, excuse me, Ephesus and Thyatira and Pergamos and all the cities that are listed in Revelation chapter 1 and 2, the seven, where, or just 2 and 3, where Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches. You remember um, he wrote to the churches in Asia Minor. But the Holy Spirit said, don't go there. It wasn't God's timing. So they decided, we'll go to Bithynia. So they traveled north, heading towards Bithynia, and then the Holy Spirit forbid them to preach in Bithynia. And so that, by that time, they're kind of heading towards the coast. They just make their way to Troas, which is all the way to the other side of the, um, the landmass there, to the edge of the Aegean Sea. And it was in Troas that Paul had a vision at night. And all of a sudden, he saw this man from Macedonia pleading, the Greek is begging him, come over here and help us. And so by that, they decided, you know, the Holy Spirit's calling us to go to Macedonia, or present-day Greece, the area of Greece. And so they chartered a ship, they were able to get on right away, they took the ship, they made it, in, on that day, they made it to Samothrace. And then they made it all the way to Neapolis in, in one day. In, in a 24-hour period, they were there in the next day. And it's like a 100-mile by boat journey. And so they made it all the way, and it says they had a straight course. It's like the Holy Spirit was just driving them there. Like they, you know, he knew they had an appointment to get there. And they got there, and on the Sabbath day, well, they went from Neapolis to Philippi, which was a Roman colony, a chief city around the area. And in Philippi, Um, On the Sabbath day, they went down to the river where the people who were Jewish met to pray. They didn't have a synagogue. And so they going down to the city, or going out of the city and down to the river, they met a woman by the name of Lydia and some other women as well. Now remember, Lydia was a seller of purple. And, you know, we could, I don't know, in, in our mind, if you think about somebody who's a seller of purple, my wife gave me a shirt this morning, it has purple on it. It would have been very, very, very expensive to buy a a garment made with purple because Tyrrhenium purple was super costly. It would be like being a diamond dealer. That's what she was. Or maybe selling Ferraris or something like that. Here's a woman who made a lot of money selling this purple that came from the snails that they, they had to dive down into the sea to get these little tiny snails. And every snail had one drop of purple toxin in its body, they squeeze it out on a piece of fabric, let it dry in the sun, and it would oxidize and turn purple. And so it was very expensive to have an entire garment made of purple. And so she was a seller of this type of fabric. She, she had, was very wealthy. And she, her heart was open to the gospel, it tells us. It was open to the gospel, and she believed what Paul was preaching, and she received Jesus, and her, whole, her and her whole household was baptized. But then it gives us a glimpse into her salesmanship, how good she is at selling. And she says, if you have counted me worthy um, uh, and faithful to the Lord, then stay with me in my house. So they're kind of stuck, you know. <laughs> we don't stay. We're saying she's not worthy. You know, so they, it says, so she convinced us. So they, they're staying in Lydia's house. And that's where we pick up our text today. They were in Lydia's house. And verse 16, it says, Now it happened, as they went to prayer, that a certain slave girl, possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Now, I don't think that it's a coincidence that they're on their way to prayer, and that's where the devil meets them. You see, the, the thing about prayer is, I think as Christians, oftentimes we don't necessarily see that as like the main thing. And yet it is. Wages, wars are waged and battles fought and won and lost in prayer when it comes to our Christian walk. There is nothing that is more important, nothing that is more powerful. And yet I think the reason that we neglect it is because it's counterintuitive, if you will. You know, probably the smartest guy in our church um, He's not here right now. Not you guys. He's the smartest guy. (laughs) I was talking to him one time, a a long time ago, and and he said, he said, I don't, you know, I just don't understand prayer. I just don't see what the point is. I I have a hard time, and I know I'm supposed to do it, so I do it, but I just don't get it. 
And, you know, because, and, you know, the, the idea behind it is just kind of ridiculous, if you will. You know, I mean, think about God already knows what we're going to pray. He, he sees from beginning to end. You know, why do we have to pray and tell him something he already knows we're going to say? You know, why, why waste the time when he already knows? And, you know, we talked about it and discussed it, and kind of as we talked about it, we came to the conclusion that the reality is God wants us to talk to him, and, and you know, talking to him isn't like rubbing a bottle and, the, and then God pops out and gives us whatever we want or says no. The idea is that I talk to him and he talks to me. And I commune with him and he communes with me. And as I spend that time in prayer, my will, my heart, my attitude is molded into his heart, his will, his attitude. That he draws me in and he begins to lead me as he changes who I am as I spend time with him. And so as I go to prayer, it, it connects me with God through relationship. And, and so the devil wants nothing to do with Christians praying. He doesn't want us connecting with the throne of God and, and, and seeing those battles that he is trying so hard to win lost as a Christian hits their knees. And so he shows up. They're out going to pray and the devil shows up. Um, this little girl who is possessed by a spirit. It, it says of divination. And I, and I suppose you could translate that um, to tell the future. A, a spirit to tell the, the fortunes or tell the future. But the word in the Greek is really interesting. It says in the Greek that she is possessed with the spirit of Python. Isn't that wild? What does that mean? It was, it's the snake. It's talking about a snake. And, and maybe that brings you back to the Garden of Eden. You think of you know, the serpent in the, in the Garden of Eden. But it actually, the reference is actually to um, Greek lore, and that is probably more thinking about Pythia. Now you remember in Greece, they had um, Pythia, who was the oracle of Delphi. And Delphi is southern more in Greece, not in, in Philippi, but southern more in Greece. And there was a, a, you know, the story in Greek mythology goes that there was a, a serpent, a, a giant python dragon or something like that. It was a dragon in some accounts and a, a serpent in other accounts. But Apollo killed the python in the belly button of, I know, um, in, the, in the belly button of Gaia or the earth. And um, it was at the place where he, he killed the python that a woman was possessed by the spirit of Python or Pythia and began to tell the future. And so the, there was a succession of oracles throughout the years, you know, and there would be a woman, she'd sit in this cave, supposedly the belly button, and the smoke would come up, she, it would intoxicate her, and she'd begin to prophesy and other things. Really, Very weird stuff, very demonic stuff happening there. Um, and this woman, and so I don't know, you know, as I read th this and kind of learned about Pythia and learned about this word, it's hard to tell whether or not this word was a colloquialism, just saying she was somebody who told fortunes, or if the author, if Luke is telling us that she was actually possessed by the same demon spirit. I don't know. I'll let you guys wrestle with that on your own. But how does she get possessed by a devil? The word in the Greek, it tells us that she is a young girl. Does the devil, can demons possess little children? Yeah. That's kind of creepy though. You think about it. It just doesn't seem right, does it? A little child could be possessed by a, a devil. Um, remember when Jesus was coming off the Mount of Transfiguration that he met a... Um, boy and his father who, you know, the disciples were trying to cast out this demon from this boy that kept throwing him into the fire. The boy was possessed by an evil spirit and Jesus, of course, cast the evil spirit out. And, and so we see examples of this in Scripture. And so how do children get possessed by a demon? How does that even happen? I would venture to guess that it's the parents of the child that had a lot to do with that. What kind of things were the parents of this little girl, the parents of that boy, involved in 
that invited demonic activity into their lives. And I think that a lot of times we just don't like to think about this type of stuff. We don't like to um, venture into the areas of demons. And we really, I think in our culture, we just don't like to think that they're real. You know, I, I, it's just an uncomfortable thought to think about. But she was being used by those who would own a share of her, and she had masters using her for the purpose of telling fortunes. And this is something, um, again, I think also that is made light of in our society. Because we live in a humanistic society where we just don't like to believe in the supernatural, we don't like to think that those types of things are dangerous. But going to a fortune teller, you know, maybe you've, been in a circus where they had a curtain and it said Madam whatever and uh, you go in there and there's a woman looks like a gypsy with a, a crystal ball in there and she's going to tell you what your future holds or following your horoscope you know of course all of paganism is based on the zodiac consulting a Ouija board playing with tarot cards having your palm read Casting spells, voodoo, Eastern meditation, New Age. Doing drugs that alter your mental state and give you spiritual experiences. Um, the Greek for witchcraft, the, the Greek word for witchcraft is pharmakia. It's where we get our word pharmacy. That doesn't mean that your pharmacist is a witch. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but, you know, the, the prices kind of make you wonder sometimes. But... <laughs> But no, this is talking about you know, somebody dropping peyote or something that's going to alter your state to where you're having hallucinations, acid, or something like that. And all these things and other mystical religious practices are actually practicing the occult. You know, and, and that, you know, maybe it's, it's harmless, you know, you think. Well, this is no big deal. It's just for fun. But honestly, it's a good way to invite demonic activity into your life. And I don't think any Christian wants demonic activity in their life. And yet this is a good way, especially as a Christian, to invite it. And how better for a demon to keep you from God, or to keep you in fear, or to get you to do what he wants you to do by supposedly telling you your future. And I know that some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. There are things that people have told you after reading your palm or something, and maybe it was just harmless fun, but they plagued you for years and years and years because you believed them just a little bit, just in the back of your mind. I had my palm read one time when I was just a little kid, and it plagued me until I was 20-something. It's amazing how a suggestion like that or just a horoscope reading that tells you something about your future will kind of unnerve you and keep you off center and never truly trusting God because you somehow believe it. Somebody told you because they hovered a pencil above your veins that you were going to have this many kids or something like that. How many boys and how many girls. All those things mess with your mind. And there, there's just a bunch of lies. It's a bunch of lies. And yet people believe these things and they trust these types of things and they can bring you into bondage. Um, you think about these parents, whoever these parents were, whoever, however this girl got demon-possessed. You know, it's interesting. I read an article um, just yesterday and it was, it was very troubling. It was about a, two 12-year-old girls who had been on the internet um, reading fantasy stuff and, and they got into this... Uh, website where they're reading about a, a character named called slender man some of you have heard of this and um you know it was it was uh basically slender man you know considered like a pied piper type of a guy you know drawing children in things like that um killing children things like that is super villain um character on the internet anyway these two girls 12 years old decided um after having a lot of dreams Slender Man was visiting one of them, at least, in, in their dreams and putting suggestions in their heads that they needed to take one of their friends and sacrifice them. And so two girls, in collusion, took one of their friends out into the woods and stabbed her 19 times. Now, praise God, she lived. 
Um, she crawled out of the woods, and a biker found her, and she, she made it. But both those two 12-year-old girls, one, it was considered insane because of all the voices and things that she was hearing, including Slender Man, um, but both of them actually ended up receiving 65 years in prison at 13 years old. It's amazing. What struck me about this story more than anything, this was the thing that troubled me more than anything. Well, I guess I shouldn't say that, but it, it troubled me. That as I read the interviews of these little girls, they weren't uneducated. They were using words that I had to look up because their, their language was, was so high level, these little girls. So they're not backwoods, superstitious you know, little girls. These, these are very well-educated girls who are prolific readers, and yet the devil pulled them right in because they were susceptible to it, because their parents didn't protect them. And so we see this little girl. This is, it's just tragic to think about. This little girl possessed by a devil. Verse 17, this girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Weird. Yeah, right? I mean, that's, that's exactly what they're doing. That's who they are. It doesn't give us a lot of detail other than that they were going to prayer one day and she showed up. All of a sudden, she's, you know, a local who's telling everybody, hey, listen to these guys. These guys are from the Most High God. They proclaim the way of salvation. Um, I think if you were a missionary and you were traveling to a foreign land and a little girl came out and started telling people that you were, you know, legit and your God sent you and that they should listen to you, they're, you're there to tell them the way of salvation, you'd probably be like, oh, that's cool. The locals are starting to, to acknowledge this, you know? It, like it, maybe it's a good thing or something. I can imagine probably the first time that Paul heard her share her message, that maybe they were appreciative of her boldness. Perhaps it wasn't weird when she came out and said, these are the servants of the Most High God. You know, they come to tell us about salvation. And, and, and it wasn't weird at all until it was. And then it was. And we see that in, in verse 18. It says, Now this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Now, here at Calvary, we have what we call the no crazy rule. And the no crazy rule is, that when it comes to the things that we do, you know, the worship that we do, the, the sermons, the speakers that we choose, the way our service is ordered, that none of it needs to be crazy or weird or flipped out or nuts. And I don't know, you've probably been to churches, you've probably had experiences where you went somewhere and there was something crazy going on. You guys ever experienced that? Something crazy. You know, several people screaming out in tongues or, you know, somebody, you know, doing some weird jig dance or something or, you know, just weird stuff, you know, and it happens in churches all the time. And, and you know, honestly, we have the no crazy rule. We base that no crazy rule on 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And that's where Paul tells the Corinthians, after he's told them already, you guys fall short in no spiritual gift. God has given you guys all the spiritual gifts within the church body that you have there. But, not everybody has to speak in tongues all at once. In fact, I forbid that. Don't do that in church. Let it be one at the most, or, or excuse me, one at a time, three at the most, and, and let it be done in order. And let one person interpret. And he goes through this list of things that he says, you guys, what you have done in your churches, you made your church services so crazy that if a non-believer came amongst you, they would say you're out of your mind. And, and so he, he is instituted, he tells them that God is a God of order. That he is, let everything be done decently and in order. God is a God of order. Not a God of chaos and craziness. And so, you know, I think that people have legitimate you know, experiences I believe that people speak in tongues. I do myself. 
but I also believe that it should be done appropriately at the right time and not in the middle of a church service. So this isn't the time or the place for something like that. And so I think what happens is people, they have experiences, they have a lot of emotion, maybe they're an emotional type of a person, and what happens is that the Spirit of God moving upon them mixed with their own personality and emotion creates a display of craziness that isn't necessarily from the Lord. Now the gift may be, but not necessarily the delivery system. And I think oftentimes the enemy exploits the weirdnesses of our own culture and whatever to discredit the gospel of Christ. And I think that that happens often. You know, I mean, if you don't believe me, just turn on Christian TV and watch. And just look at society and look at re, you know, normal and then look at that. It's like nobody dresses like that, nobody acts like that. You know, and, and I don't think that they're insincere necessarily. I'm not trying to um, question their motives. But I'm just saying I know that people get wasted and watch that stuff and make fun of it because it is so crazy, right? And so Paul, he's going along, this girl's speaking, she's saying the right message, but he notices, I, I'm guessing he notices something is off. Now, why didn't Paul just cast out the demon the first time he saw her? I would submit to you that he didn't because he didn't realize what was going on at first. Can Paul not realize what's going on? Yeah. I mean, we saw that when he went to Asia and the Holy Spirit said, don't go to Asia. Well, there goes those plans. Okay, we'll go to Bithynia. Nope, don't go to Bithynia. Okay, what do we do, Lord? You know, we're, all of us are just being led by the Holy Spirit. You know, things slip past us, don't they? And things slip past Paul. And so this girl shows up on the scene. It doesn't say that she had stringy hair, ripped clothes, or eyes rolled back and slightly green skin. Ah. You know, it, didn't, it doesn't describe her that way. It just says she's a little girl and she says this. And so, at the beginning, maybe it wasn't a big deal. She probably looked like a little princess dressed by the businessmen who owned her. Because, you know, you, you take care of what your investments, right? Something we need to be aware of is Satan doesn't always package evil in sinister packages. Sometimes, they look just like Turkish delight, right? Or Twinkies. Box of Twinkies. <laughs> Second Corinthians 11.14 says this, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing that his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. Here's a minister of Satan dressed up like a little girl. <coughs> Innocent enough, sweet enough. Have you ever had anybody come to your door to tell you a different gospel wearing a witch's outfit? Or a wolf costume? I know what they're about. You know, <laughs> I, know what that, I know what's going on here. Don't try to fool me, wolf. Right? No. It's not ever that obvious. They come dressed in a tie and a suit with a little name tag, right? They, they, they come with, with information, with pamphlets, and, and they're coming to share deeper truth with you. And they come with a smile on their face. They come saying, we are Christians. With a big smile on their face and very sweet, very nice offering to do housework for you. And yet they carry with them a different gospel. I met a woman one time at an expo. I was working a booth with a radio station I was DJing for. And she came up and, I mean, she just oozed sweetness. She was so sweet. So, you know, just Wonderful. She disabled woman. She'd been in some sort of accident. And I guess in her accident, she had had a near-death experience where she had seen God. And she had a disciple with her who was there to tell me how wonderful she was. And she was, wouldn't stop telling me how wonderful this woman was and how she's seen God and she knows Him and everything. And, and I got to talking to her. And, 
And, you know, I, and I said something about, you know, we just want less people to go to hell, you know. And she, her eyes got really big and she's like, there is no hell. And she, I mean, you could almost see the flames coming out of her eyes. And she just turned like from this sweet person to this just like evil. No, God is love. You know, you just, it was like, she got really angry. And she loved it. You know, and here's somebody deceived. All roads lead to God. All roads lead to heaven. And yet Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The gospel is, is intact in that Jesus died for sinners, right? And that he offers you who are on your way to eternal torment, on your way to hell, he offers you eternal life if you will just put your trust in him. He died for your sins. We call that the grace of God. Nothing we can do to earn that. Nothing we can do to deserve what Jesus has done for us. It's all him. And yet Paul would write to the Galatians and he would say this. He say, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ. The grace, the free gift, right? So that means the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which isn't another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ. What do they do to pervert the good news of Christ? They say, well, this is that Jesus came, but you know, to really get to heaven or to really be pleasing to God, you have to do all these works. Or you have to join this system or you have to be baptized by us or you have to follow these rules. And yet Jesus died on the cross for us and if we believe in Him, it, the Bible says we will not perish but have everlasting life. Right? That's the gospel. That's the good news. It's good news. And yet when somebody says, we want to show you all of the laws and the ordinances of the gospel, is that good news? No. It's not. They pervert the gospel of Christ, and then he goes on to say, but even if we, he says, even if we come back to you and have a different message, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, let him be anathema, is the Greek meaning eternally condemned to hell. If they have a different gospel, a different Jesus, a different message than the grace of Christ. As we have said before, now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. You know, years ago, there was an hour of decision on, the t- on TV where Billy Graham would have his TV program. And the Watchtower Tower Bible and Tract Society, which is the Jehovah's Witnesses, purchased the hour after it. And as the gospel would go forward. Billy Graham did a big crusade and everybody would hear what Billy Graham had to say. And then the hour after it, they had beautiful pictures, Bible verses coming up, and a number that somebody could call if they wanted prayer. Can you believe that? People who were unsuspecting, who just heard the good news from Billy Graham and maybe weren't quite ready to make that decision or, or didn't call in, they, they would be bait and switch and now all of a sudden we're going to try to pull people in people who the seeds were planted in to try to pull them into a cult they did the same thing in new york one time billy graham had a crusade there and they had a big you know it was a big um stadium filled with people and the next day the jehovah's witness had rented the stadium and they held a baptism there and during the billy graham's crusade they passed out leaflets come tomorrow to get baptized same place and they, they advertised it and everything. And they had, it was at the time, it was a Guinness Book of World Record baptism. And the Jehovah's Witnesses, completely unsuspecting, linking themselves. Look, hey, we're with these guys, right? Wrong. Wrong. That's what she's doing. That's what this little girl is doing. Well, what the demon is doing is just saying, hey, yeah, listen to these guys. And, and then just being ready, being there to subvert and to pull people away when the time comes. You know, linking, there's, oh, we're Christians too. We hear it. And in all those things, we hear this, the hiss of the python, don't we? It's demonic. Oftentimes, Satan has people planted in churches to try to draw people away. And we've had people like that over the years. 
They, they're here for a while, and it's amazing to me because like the second they get here, they're just like, oh, Pastor Mike, you're so wonderful. You're so wonderful. Oh, that best sermon I ever heard, Pastor Mike. You know, And they're just buttering me up, buttering me up, buttering me up, making me think that they're there with good intentions, and then the next thing you know, they're <laughs> you know, ripping people away. It's happened. We see those people. And, and you know, God hates that. He hates those who cause division. That's the, what the word heretic means, one who causes division. You know, it's sad, but that's how the enemy works. He, he joins and then he rips apart. And that's what she's doing. So verse 19, it says, and of course, Paul casts out in the name of Jesus, he casts out this demon, power in the name of Jesus. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they had no care for the well-being of this little girl, that she is now free from this demonic power. They only wanted her to exploit her for their own benefit. Verse 20, it says, And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. In Acts 19... We're going to see the same type of thing happen when those who make idols of Diana realize that they're losing money because of Paul's preaching. And they'll cause an uproar in the city and arrest the Christians and everything. Um, It's amazing what people will do when their livelihood, when their income is in danger. And, you know, honestly, I think it results in, in, I think you'll probably see this more with men than with women. The reason I say that is because in men, as part of the fall in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam, you know, you're going to till the ground, thorns and thistles it's going to produce from you, for you, and by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your bread all the days of your life. And, and in every man, there is a deep anxiety of being able to provide for his family. And that can easily turn into a greed for more that is insatiable. And so when you have a man who has this little girl that he's exploiting, and obviously they have no conscience because they're exploiting a, a young girl, and using her for money, there is no end to the lies and deception and the deceit that this, these people will do to try to get their way. Now what is beautiful is that Jesus Christ came into this world, lived a perfect life, the perfect man, died upon the cross for our sins, and broke the curse. And so as Christian men, you no longer have to have that anxiety of providing for your family. I know you feel it still there, but you don't have to have it because you know what? My God will supply all my needs through His riches in Christ Jesus. We're no longer under the curse where we have to worry about what we're going to eat tomorrow or what we're going to wear, right? Jesus said this, didn't He? Didn't He say, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will wear. Consider the sparrows. They don't sow and reap. They They don't plant and harvest. But your Father feeds them. You're much more valuable than a sparrow. Will He not take care of you? What are you going to wear? He, he says, look at the grass of the field. They're clothed with lilies. And they're more beautiful than Solomon in all of his glory. And yet today they're there and tomorrow they're bundled up and thrown in the fire. How much more God will clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. And we could trust Him. That He's going to take care of us. And as Christians, we have a great opportunity to have a God who we know loves us and is going to take care of us and as we know that He loves us and is going to take care of us, we, we don't have to worry about, ne- about starving to death, do we? Now, there may be times in our lives that we have little, where we are hungry for a while. But we're not going to starve. We know that He's going to take care of us. Ultimately, He's going to take care of us. But then there's other times also that we abound, right? And God blesses us. And so, but it doesn't matter either way whether we're abasing or whether we're abounding. We find ourselves content. Why? Because Jesus is the one thing in life that we yearn for. He's the one possession in life that nobody can take from us. 
The one thing that we have that never goes away and the only thing that we have that satisfies. So these men are concerned about their livelihood. Paul and Silas are arrested. <laughs> it says, verse 22, Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. And so it doesn't say they question Paul and Silas. What happened? They're given no chance. This is completely illegal, by the way. They, they should have been able to at least share their side. You notice that the story these guys told was not, they cast the demon out of our little girl, and we can't get money from her anymore. That, that wasn't the message. The message was, they have customs that are unlawful for us as Romans to receive. Now, it's interesting because around this same time, and it's believed to be correlated with this, in Rome, Caesar was disgusted with the Jews and cast all the Jews out of Rome. And so Philippi being a, a Roman colony, it's believed that they, they kind of had the same sentiment towards the Jews. And so to bring Jews up and saying these guys are causing trouble, would he immediately have caused the magistrates to treat them unfairly? And that's what I believe we're seeing here because they're not given an opportunity to speak or to share their side of what's happened. They're Jews, you know, and we see that throughout history, don't we, with the Jewish people? Treated unfairly, um, singled out, and persecuted. And so they tell the jailer, to, they give him strong instructions about their incarceration. Verse 24, it says, Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, the stocks that they would use were, it was a bar with like these, I don't know what you call it. It looked like a, a comb. A, lo, a giant comb. And they'd put their feet far apart. And then they'd put this bar across it so basically their feet would be spread out. Very, very uncomfortable. And they have to sit or stand with their feet kind of in a splits position. And they put the, he put them in the inner prison. Now, their prisons had several layers. First layer was kind of general population. The second layer would have been um, kind of the maximum security or whatever. I mean, then they had a hole that they put people down in the ground. No ventilation. They just throw them down this hole with a chain around them, and they would sit in, the, in their own filth, in their own waste. Oftentimes, when they dropped them down the hole, they'd break bones. They'd just sit there in their own feces and urine. Just awful, awful conditions. We see that actually in Rome, in the Mamertine prison, that's where Paul was placed. They threw him down a hole. It's just an awful, awful place. It seems that these guys were put in behind the second gate. And so they're in, not, the, not down in the hole, but they're in the second prison behind two locked gates on the other side of the general population. And so they're sitting in there, feet, feet fastened in the stocks, prison doors slammed behind them. And I want you to notice what happens next, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Imagine that. Two guys who had just done a good deed to a little girl, and they were treated horribly for it. And yet, what is their attitude? To pray and to sing hymns. What would your attitude be if somebody arrested you unlawfully and threw you into a prison after beating you without hearing any testimony or you, know, you, had, you could say nothing? What would you be saying? Think about that for a minute. Where's my lawyer? <laughs> I get one phone call. What's going on? This is no fair. You know I mean? It's crazy. It doesn't seem like they said anything. And we don't know what they said. It doesn't tell us, but it's just they're in there. And then next thing you know, they're singing hymns to God. I was thinking a lot about this this week, this past week. Here we all are, sitting in this room. Hopefully we're fully clothed, right? I think we all are. Our belly is probably full from breakfast this morning. Starting to get a little bit hungry because it's afternoon now. So hopefully Mike won't go too long. (laughs) 
You're sitting in padded seats drinking freshly ground coffee if you so choose. Maybe you pumped it full of poisonous creamers in the back. <laughs> but that's your freedom to do that. You could walk out if you wanted to. And yet I would venture to guess, even in the padded chair that you're sitting in, I would venture to guess that there are probably many in this room that don't have the joy that these two guys had who were at midnight, naked, bleeding, in stocks, behind bars, in prison, praying and singing hymns. What was the source of their joy? The source of their joy was faith. And I think the reason that we sit in here in this comfortable environment, climate-controlled room, and don't have joy is because we don't have faith. What do you mean? I mean not everybody comes here expecting God to be here. Not everybody comes here expecting that God is going to meet us Excited to experience what God is going to do and expecting God to use you or me. If we came, think about what this church would be like. If every Sunday we came here expecting God to use us, expecting God to be here, expecting God to do something great. What would the atmosphere be like here? Would God not do something great if all of us expected Him to? You know, a lot of people, I think because of our consumer society, a lot of people come to church thinking, oh man, I hope that the worship's good today. I, I, hope, that, I hope that Pastor Mike has something for me today to, to say. Or maybe even I hope God speaks to me. And that's okay. I think that we should have that anticipation or we should have that hope. But more than that, I think we miss out when we don't think about the greater thing of God doing something. God moving. God's going to be there in that place. And so I want to worship Him like He's there. I want to listen like He's speaking to me. And I want His Holy Spirit to use me to minister to other people who are there. You know, if we have that type of expectation, all the irritation and all the, the lack, lacking of joy just dissolves. And it, it becomes exciting to go to church once again. Exciting to experience God. You know, there's something really strange and maybe this, maybe this teeters on the edge of the no crazy rule. But there's a phenomenon that happens when somebody has been filled by the Holy Spirit. And, and that is that when you are completely filled to overflowing by the Holy Spirit, you can't walk into a room of people without the Holy Spirit and getting up on all everybody in the room. <laughs> it happens. I don't know why. I don't understand it. But when somebody is overflowing with the Holy Spirit and they walk into a place, it affects the people in the room. And it changes the way things are. Now, I've read about this a lot. You know, people who are um, living in times of revival and they get together in these small prayer meetings and they all pray together and, and God pours His Spirit out on them. And then they leave and go up from that place and they go to a church or they go to a crowd somewhere, and all of a sudden, unexplicably, people are convicted of their sin, and they fall down and repent and weep. Just because that person walked into the room, and the Holy Spirit is just oozing from them. And I don't understand that. But I know that it comes with expectation. And it won't come where there is no faith. Remember when Jesus came to His hometown of Nazareth? It says that he healed a few people there, but he could do no mighty thing there because of what? Their unbelief. They didn't believe God was going to do anything. And so it hindered him from being able to. 
And yet if we came filled with faith, filled with belief, filled with expectation, I think God wants to bless us today. I think God wants to do something awesome here today. If we came with that attitude, how it would change the atmosphere of the church and how God would pour His Spirit out on that place as we see here in verse 26. Notice, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Not just the chains of Paul and Silas. All the prisoners who were listening to them too. Everybody's chains fell off. And that is the effect when somebody is filled with the Holy Spirit and they interact with other people, chains are loosed because God is there. God was in that prison because Paul and Silas were in that prison. And they had a different attitude. See, this is, this is the thing. The part I forgot. It's important. Paul and Silas just were mistreated horribly. Thrown into prison. I believe that their attitude was this. Man, God must have something huge to do behind those prison doors if He's going to go through all this effort to get us there. God must want to do something big there. Because I believe that Paul and Silas would have been praying and singing hymns even if they were back at their apartment. Back at Lydia's house. They're just doing what they were going to do anyway. But they knew that they were there because God wanted to do something there. And we're going to see what God wanted to do there in the next section, so read ahead. But they were there with that anticipation. How would it be if you anticipated that? God, is, I'm going to church today, so you must want to do something awesome there. God, I'm a man, and I'm at ballet class with my little girl. This isn't where I want to be, but you must want to do something awesome here if you sent me here. God, here I am at the grocery store, buying groceries again. But you have me here at this time, at this, at this moment, because you must, must want to reach somebody. What if everywhere we went, we had that anticipation, had that excitement, had that joy? Not just here at church. You get arrested because you made the wrong turn and hit, hit a power pole and you know, knock somebody's power out. And you're in jail. Okay, God, I guess you want me in jail. What do you want to do here? That should be our attitude. That should be our, our focus every time. And I think that's why Paul and Silas were not complaining at this point. They knew that they were there on purpose. And as they prayed and as they sang, the prison doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. As we close today, we think about all of these things. Maybe you're in chains of some kind. Maybe you're in prison of some kind. Maybe a prison of fear. A prison of regret or guilt. Or a prison of, of bitterness. Failed expectations. Maybe you feel like you're in prison at work. In the station that you, God has you in life. And yet I would encourage you to change that fear and that bitterness and all those things into expectation and say, God, I want to repent of this. What I've been feeling and what I've been experiencing and what I've been living in. And I, I want to give that to you. And I want you to replace this bondage, these chains, this prison cell, this dungeon with your joy and with faith. Because I believe you have good things for me in my life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the example that we have in Paul and Silas who, who didn't think it was a mistake that they were arrested, that they were thrown into that particular prison with that particular jailer, with those particular cellmates who would listen to them sing. And Jesus, you, you are in control of everything. You know all that is happening in our lives. You know what we've been through. You know what we're going through. You know our chains and the things that bind us. And you know the doors that are shut behind us. Lord, you know our frame. You know our weaknesses. You know those thoughts that plague us. 
those evil things inside that, that tempt us. And yet, Jesus, You can set us free from these chains. I just pray, Lord, that in the midst of wherever we are, whatever cell we find ourselves in, whatever chains we find ourselves bound by, that we would surrender those things to You, Jesus. And that You would set us free. That You'd open up the doors and the chains would fall off as we begin to expect great things from You, Lord. Increase our faith. Help us to believe in You, Lord, that You have done it all. And that You love us that we might live in power and resurrection life because of you, Jesus. I want you to just take a moment this morning just as we sit here and just surrender those things to the Lord. Just take a moment to do that. Jesus, we trust you that you do forgive us, Lord. Our lives will be yours and that we can live in victory. As we take communion today, Lord, we celebrate that. Knowing that you died for our sins, knowing that your body was, was punished for ours. And knowing that believing on you brings life to us. So help us to walk in life and in newness of life. In your name we pray. Amen.